good afternoon and welcome to the Pulse. Uh, over the last few months, we have been talking about the Nesin Creed, and we are contending for the faith, and we are looking for the, the, the basics of the Christian faith that needs to be it, that need to be defended. We've looked at the uh, aspects that have been challenged over history and the fundamentals that are critical that need to be defended. So today we want to continue in the same in the same vein and continue to build ourselves in our most holy faith, being established in the in the doctrine, correctly dividing the the, the gospel of the truth. So shall we just pray as we begin? Father, we thank you for revelation, for understanding, and for clarity as we search the scriptures, as we pursue you, as we seek to know more of who you are and what you are doing in our lives. We give you the glory and we give you the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So last week we were talking about the atonement. We, the week before we had looked at a faulty or flawed theories of the atonement. And then last week we talked about the biblical basis of the atonement. And so today we want to look at another aspect that comes out of the Nisim Creed. What is very interesting is that this aspect is uh, one of the most profound, it's the linchpin of our faith. And yet in the Nisim Creed, it's just a, stated as one paragraph or rather on one, one phrase. So I, I want to zero in into it. We, we may have to do two or three sessions just talking about this because it's really critical. The whole of the faith really depends on the veracity and the truthfulness of that, that one thing. So let's start as we have always done, talking about the Nisim Creed by reciting the Creed itself. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate or made man by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And that all speaks to the atonement. And on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And I acknowledge one baptism, for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And the, the phrase that is critical that I, I want to zero in on in these two or three sessions is starting today is talking of Jesus. He says, on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. So I want to talk about the resurrection. Now, we bear in mind that there, in my view, there are three basic essential, or rather three minimum essential facts for the gospel to be the gospel. One is the, the person of Jesus Christ. We say it is one, one in one nature of the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, or in one person of the person of Jesus Christ. There are two natures, the Son of God and the Son of Man, fully God and fully man. So the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ are critical as part of the gospel. And the second thing that we need to, that is critical, a minimum essential for the gospel of the gospel, is that Jesus died in our place and for us. So the death of Jesus Christ or the atonement is a critical aspect of the gospel. And the final aspect is that the resurrect is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, Romans 10 verse 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. You declare the divinity of Jesus. You believe in your heart the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You believe that he was raised from the dead. Those three things are essential for our salvation. They're essential for us to have a relationship with God. And that's very important. So today we, are, we, we have already talked about the personality of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. We've talked about the atonement that he died in our place for us. And we talked about what it looks like. So the third element in the, in, in the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the, let me put it this way, as they put it in theology, is that Christianity is falsifiable, meaning that it can be proven false. It can be tested. It's a fact that can be tested, that can be proven. Or you can look at it another way and say Christianity is verifiable. In other words, it can be proven to be true. So Christianity is falsifiable and is verifiable. Now, we, what do we mean by that? We're saying the, whether Christianity is true or false is what we are talking about. It's something that can be verifiable. It's something that can be falsifiable based on the resurrection. You see, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we cannot take his claim seriously. So Christianity becomes false. Christianity is baseless without the resurrection. That's how critical the resurrection is. However, if Jesus rose from the dead, we can be confident that his statements are true, and therefore Christianity is verifiable. It's proven to be true. So what I'm saying is that the resurrection is the centerpiece of our faith. And if it is the centerpiece of our faith, if it is a historical event, then it has to be historically verifiable. And God made sure that it will be historically verifiable. So we, our faith is not a blind faith because the resurrection is a fact. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 18 to 17. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified that God raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Do you remember? I said this is the linchpin of the faith. If Jesus, excuse me, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, if the resurrection is a fiction, not a fact, then our faith is worthless and we are in our sins. Now, do you, do you understand the weight of that statement? Do you understand the weight of the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? So the Nicene Creed simply says, Jesus Christ died, was buried, and was rose again according to the scriptures. That resurrection is critical because without a belief in the resurrection, without fighting and defending for the resurrection, then our faith is in vain. And those who have sought to attack the Christian faith intelligently, they know that the issue to attack is the issue of the resurrection. So I want to show you the biblical basis that the resurrection of Jesus is a fact of history. It did happen. So um, today we are going to focus on biblical evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm, I'm focusing on biblical evidence because, you know, 
the, the, many people say, oh, you can't use biblical evidence because you see, I don't even believe the Bible. Listen, the Bible and the, the people, I mean, even hostile people have actually claimed, they've actually studied the Bible, not from a faith perspective, but from as a historical document. And they've said that the Bible is the most, the, the, bibli the biblical record is the most uh, verifiable, historically authenticated document, historical document. And God built it like that. We, we, we could another day, another time, we could actually show how you can see that you, there is more evidence of the authenticity and the truthfulness of the Bible. And more manuscripts that, de that demonstrate that than the, the historical person like Socrates or, or Julius Caesar, whom we take for fact or the Gallic Wars, which we take for facts, there is literally historical data compared to the data of the truthfulness of the Bible. So, so we are looking at what the Bible says and we are looking at a historical document and saying that document is true. And now let's take the data that comes out of the Bible when it comes to believing and talking about the resurrection. So the first thing that we, we need to see is that Jesus himself, while he was here on earth, he put emphasis on his resurrection and he made claims that he would be raised from the dead. He spoke about his resurrection before it ever, even happened because it was that important. Listen to Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 to 19. He says, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. And he will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And on the third day, you will be raised up. On the third day, you will be raised up. You are already speaking to his resurrection and you are saying, this will happen. So the resurrection, he speaks about it. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So Jesus spoke to his resurrection before it even happened. Mark 9, 31, and the son of man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. So Jesus is making claims about his resurrection and he's speaking to the, to, to the facts to say, you will be killed by the Gentiles and you will be buried and on the third day, you will rise again. In John 2, verses 19 to 21, Jesus answered them, said, destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it up. Then the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? And they were shocked. But he was speaking, the Bible says, of the temple of his body. He was speaking of his resurrection already. So we see that Jesus spoke to his resurrection. He spoke to, to, to that you would be raised. He spoke to it before it even happened. But not only did Jesus claim his, his, that, that he would rise again from the dead, but we see in the Bible, we see that the, the, this fact, you know, one of the things, when you look at the, something to say it's a fact, it must stand the test. And there are some tests, and one of those, there must be eyewitnesses who are credible. And there must be numerous eyewitnesses to that event who can speak from different perspectives and who are witnesses of this event. And God did not leave himself without a witness. Listen to us. So the other thing that we need to look at when we are talking about the historicity, and the truthfulness of the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the linchpin of our faith, we need to see whether there are eyewitness accounts. Because any historical document, any historical event has to be verifiable by eyewitnesses. It becomes credible the moment we have eyewitnesses. And the Bible does give us eyewitness accounts of people who encountered him when he rose again. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, this is Luke who is writing, he says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach 
until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And to this, he also presented himself alive after his resurrection, after his suffering, by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 years. Listen, listen, this is not fandom. This is not, uh, this is, he appeared to the disciples alive after he, is, after he had been killed. And he, he produced many convincing proofs. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Now, so the people who are giving witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when they read the Bible, they saw him, they ate with him, they touched him after he rose from the dead. They, they, you see, it can't be daydreaming because you, you can't daydream for 40 days. You can't have convincing proofs. We can't have many people having this hallucination. It is the working of God. So God gave ember proof to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts 2.32, in, in what we call the caring matter, the, 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 the preaching of the gospel, these guys, immediately after Jesus has been raised from the dead, they go and they start preaching the gospel. And look, in Acts 2.32, this is after the Holy Spirit has fallen upon them. In their first encounter, this, this is Peter and, the, and the, 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 the apostles who have been scared of the Jews, who have been hiding away from the Jews. The moment the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they become his witnesses. And in Acts 2.32, this is what the Bible says. See, Peter says, this Jesus, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. We have seen it, we have evidence, we have proof that God raised the Jesus whom you killed. Those are eyewitness accounts. People who were there when he died, who saw him when he was risen. It's 3.15. Peter goes on. He says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him to life. And we are witnesses of this fact. Now, can, can, can you believe this? Can you believe this? How, how powerful this is. Peter is talking to the people who killed Jesus. And they said, you killed him, but God raised him to life. And we are witnesses of this faith. It's not a myth. It's not something. It's a fact. Christianity is based on the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that the resurrection of Jesus is critical to our faith. In X4, 18 to 20. The, 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 the apostles are called before the Sanhedrin. So, so they called the apostles back in and told them never again to speak or teach about Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about these wonderful things we have seen and heard. We cannot be stopped. We cannot be silenced. We are willing to die. And each one of the, the apostles, apart from, apart from John and Judas, who hanged himself, each one was willing to die for the things they have seen and heard. You see, people who are willing to go to their death to defend what they see, seen and heard. That's authenticity. That's incredible historical evidence. We cannot stop, stop telling about the wonderful things we have seen and heard. We have seen and heard the wonderful stories of the resurrection of Jesus. L listen to them. Acts 5, 30 to 32. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. They, they, are, they are challenging them. God our Father, you have raised Jesus from the dead. Think about it. the easiest way. I mean, God is a way of doing things. You see, for him to demonstrate the veracity, the truthfulness 
of the resurrection and that being the linchpin of the Christian faith. You see, the worst place to start a, a faith or a belief uh, based on a lie would have been Jerusalem because the people were there who killed him, who saw Jesus dead. So when the apostles rise up and they say, God raised Jesus from the dead and we are bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Their enemies, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they, 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 they would not even have a the problem. All they needed to do was to go to that tomb, open it up, provide the body of Jesus, and kill the Christian faith. But the fact that their enemies never could produce a body, can you imagine, think about it, when there is a murder, one of the key things is to say, produce the body, produce the evidence that there is a matter. So this is one, this is what we are saying, that the, the Pharisees, the enemies of the faith, could not produce evidence that Jesus died and remained dead. Because indeed, God raised him from the dead. That's why they could not challenge the kirigma, the message of the gospel, when this guy says, we are witnesses, in Acts 10, 39 to 40 says, we are witnesses of everything that Jesus did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. God raised him on the third day. The resurrection had eyewitnesses to it. People saw him die saw him raised. People went to the empty tomb and found the tomb empty. Now let, let's go a little bit deeper in terms of these eyewitnesses. You see, God set this thing up in such a way that the resurrection will be the most verifiable event in antiquity, in ancient history. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. This is Paul. It says, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that's the text that the Nicene Creed text. But now the, the immediate person is, okay, how do you know he was raised? You're, you're talking fair boss. He says, no, 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 no. There's evidence. There were eyewitnesses. He appeared to Peter. And then to the 12. This is First Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Listen, this is incredible. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now. So at the time Paul was writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, he was saying, you guys, you can check this out. It's verifiable. It stands the test. There are more than 500 brothers who saw him. So what was he saying? He said, you can go and check it for yourself. Go, the witnesses are there. They have not disappeared. The witnesses are there. That is incredible. He goes on to say, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. Then he appeared to James. James is the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then to all the apostles, and last of all, is to one untimely born. He appeared to me also. So there are eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He appeared to Mary Magdalene when she went to the tomb on that first Sunday. There's evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, th th these are friendly eyewitnesses. But John 19, 33 to 35 says, when they came to Jesus, this is the day of the crucifixion, 
and found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And John, who is writing this, says, the man who saw it is given his testimony, and his testimony is true. They are eyewitnesses. These things did not happen behind a corner. They happened openly. The eyewitnesses were not inclined to believe. Remember, the Bible says when they, in, in Matthew chapter 28, when, they, they, when Mary and the ladies went and told the disciples that Jesus was raised from the dead and he had given a message to say, Go, come and meet me by, in Galilee at the hill that I told you about. He says, some doubted. They doubted him. They thought these women were taking, talking strange things. In John 20, 24 to 30, we, 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 we have a record of the story of Thomas. He says, but Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came, when he appeared to the apostles. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. They were excited and they were talking about the resurrections. We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my head into his side, I will not believe. <laughs> Many people call him a doubting Thomas. But I think he's pragmatic. He said, give me the evidence. Then the Bible says, goes on to say, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, <clears throat> and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here. With, reach here with your hand and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. That's what Jesus said. And Thomas answered him and said, my Lord and my God. What a powerful testimony. Of it. My Lord and my God. Many people focus on the fact that Thomas doubted. And yet, even the other disciples, if you read before this in John 20, Jesus showed them the, 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 the nail prints in his head. But you see, it was Thomas who says, my Lord and my God. What's a declaration of faith? And Jesus said to him, because you have seen, if you believed, blessed are they who did not see and yet have believed. So we have eyewitness accounts. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4 says, this salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. There is evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we need to understand this evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, one of the critical evidence of the genuineness of the faith is the fact that Jesus appeared first to Mary of Magdalene. And she was the first to proclaim the gospel. If the resurrection was a myth, if the gospel was not true, they would not have written, if, if it was fabricated, they, they knew that <clears throat> within the Jewish society, at that time, women were not credible witnesses. They would have tried to manufacture a man with a high credentials, but God says, no, 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 no. The woman is the first one who will proclaim the gospel. So John 20, verse 40 says, And Mary Magdalene turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. 
is the first who saw Jesus. In Mark 16, verse 9. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Jesus first appeared to a woman. And many people talk about, oh, the Bible oppresses women. No, 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 no. The woman was, Jesus elevated the role of a woman and said, look, the, man, the, the first person to proclaim the gospel will be a woman. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, 9, and behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they, they, they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. They are eyewitnesses. And again, a most compelling evidence that the tomb was empty. It was not an apologetic device, nor a legend. It is that it was first discovered by women. Daryl Allison, a deist scholar who doesn't even believe in God, says this, the discovery of the empty tomb by Mary Magdalene and the other women commends itself as likely nonfiction. In other words, the setup by God for Mary Magdalene to be the one to go and declare the resurrection. Historically, is evidence that this is not a fiction. This is reality. Dr. Paul L. Meyer says, professor of Western Michigan University says, if the resurrection accounts had been manufactured, women would never have been included in the story, at least not as the first witnesses. So this, so God set this up to demonstrate that it's not manufactured, it's genuine. Michael Grant, a non-Christian historian, says this. If we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary source or document to the story of the resurrection, the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. Jesus rose from the dead. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. Today, the tomb is empty. So the empty tomb is one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, there's a story that people will say, they, 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 and it is, the people who started lying, fabricated a story to explain away the resurrection by saying that Jesus, the stone had been rolled away, that his, his disciples, that his disciples stole the body. But that is not plausible. That is not possible. You see, the Bible says in Matthew, clearly, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 60, he says, when Jesus was buried, he was laid in in, a, in his own new tomb, which had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled, this is Joseph of Arimathea. He says, laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Rolled a large stone at the entrance of the tomb and went away. It's not possible. If you look at this picture I have, the, the, it says an extremely large stone. You see this stone. It is further up. It's rolled down to close there. So, so Joseph of Arimathea and the, 
uh, the people he was with, like uh, uh, like Nicodemus, they rolled, they could slide that stone down and close that tomb. Now, obviously, people will be saying, how did he roll the stone? It's the force of gravity. You see, the stone is further up here and it's being rolled downward. And you can also see that it was held in a groove with a wedge. So once you remove the wedge and you roll it down, mm -hmm. he can seal that. Now, why is that important? It's important because it would take immense, incredible manpower to move it back upward, away from the tomb entrance. So remember, this is a, an incline downwards. So to move it up is not a small task. The, so the disciples, fearful as they were, could not have come and pushed that rock. Let alone, before we even talk about the fact that they, they were uh, Roman soldiers, we can deal with that later on. But you see, the scriptural evidence here that we need to look at, the Greek word to say rolled the stone is kileo. You roll the stone upward. Mark added the preposition ana, meaning you're rolling it upward when you compare to Matthew. And so you are rolling it upward. So anakilio means to roll something up a slope or an incline, which scared disciples could not do because if they were coming by stealth at night, they, get, they, they needed such collaboration to be able to roll that stone up. So in, you clearly, <clears throat> the new position of the stone was up a slope and then incline relative to its original position, which would have been fairly difficult for the, for the apostles to do. If you look at the, 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 the rendition in Luke 24 too, he says, says the word kileo, but he said the preposition apple, which means the separation from taking it a distance. So what he was talking about was say apokilio then means to roll one object from another so that it is separated in some distance from. And that's what we see. The stone was rolled away. Apokilio. And that is critical. In John 20 verse 1, he used another Greek word which means arrow. Which, is, which means to pick something up and carry it away. So the, all of these are used to clearly tell that the stone has been rolled away. But listen, here, here, is, the, here is the mistake most believers make. They think the stone was rolled away so that Jesus would be raised from the dead. No, 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 no. That's, that's not it. You see, <clears throat> remember Jesus when he had the resurrection body, he could enter a closed room. He could leave a closed room. He was not limited to space, time dimensions. So Jesus did not need this stone to be rolled away for him to rise again. He rose again by the power of God as a spiritual body. And but the stone was rolled away by the angels so that there would be evidence, so that the apostles, when they came on, John, Peter and John could got into the, they would see the stone tomb is empty. When Mary got there, she looked in and peeped and saw that the tomb was empty. So the, the rolling of the stone was not for him to rise from the dead because he rose from the dead with that seal in. But he rose from the dead and God opened the tomb so that there may be evidence of that resurrection so that we would see that indeed the tomb is empty. That's very important. You see, the, the other thing that is 
scary is to say that <clears throat> Roman soldiers were asked to guard this tomb. Remember the guys that said, we know that he, he, the, 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 this, this guy may, he, he may deceive people. His, his uh, disciples may come and steal the body. And so they, they, they prevailed on Pilate to put a Roman seal over the stone and to put a Roman guard. But the Roman guards, the Roman soldiers went a war. Now, remember the Pharisees had to say to them, you know what, we will speak to you. To, if this comes to the governor, go and lie. And they gave him a lot of money and said, go and say his disciples came and stole. But you see, the Roman soldiers ordinarily would not do that, would not say that. Because you see, under Roman law, there was a death penalty required for a soldier who deserted his post. So when they went a war, if they were to say this body was stolen, it means they went a war, they were not on duty, or they were asleep. And that falling asleep would be a cause to be, when you are on the watch, you would actually be killed. Or if they left their night watch. These are three of almost eight reasons why there was a death penalty in the Roman military in that time. So, this story is concocted. Because the Romans were, were particular in their duty. But remember, when they saw the angels, when Jesus had already been raised from the dead, when the angels moved the grave, the, 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 that light stone, the Bible says they fell as dead. So the tomb is empty. So we, we see the resurrection is a confirmed fact. And let me emphasize again that Jesus, when he rose again, there were eyewitnesses. He appeared to so many people. For emphasis, I want to just say it again. In Luke, 24, 34, the Bible clearly says that Jesus appeared to Peter. It says the Lord is really risen, has appeared to Simon. Luke 24, 15, remember he appeared to the disciples, the two disciples on their journey to Emmaus. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. In Luke 24, 36, Jesus appeared to his disciples, the apostles, and while they were telling these things, you mean the guys from Emmaus, when they came back and they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. Again, showing that he has risen from the dead. In John 21, verse 1, he appeared by the Sea of Tiberias. When they had gone with Peter, I think there were probably seven apostles, disciples. And they said, we go, we'll go fishing. And Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples in the Sea of Tiberias. Then like we mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, he appeared to more than 500 believers. It says he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 7, he appeared to James, the brother of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is, this is critical. Most of the appearances were appearances to people who are believing were already his disciples. But you see, when he says he appeared to James, he's talking about James the elder. James who wrote the book of James. James the brother of the Lord Jesus. Remember the Bible says that the, the, his brothers did not believe him. So he, he appeared to a hostile witness. When, when there is a hostile witness who bears testimony that something has happened. It's not in their best interest to demonstrate. But he says Jesus rose again, appeared to James. And James lived to tell the story. And James became a believer. That is a powerful testimony, a powerful evidence. When somebody has no vested interest, 
gives witness to an event. That hostile witness, when they confirm that something happened, it makes a, the issue factual and historical and believable. In Matthew 28, 16 to 17, he appeared after the resurrection to the 11. Says the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. So Jesus showed himself in numerous ways, different times. Then, like we said in X1, X1 verse 3, it, 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 just before his ascension, he appeared. He says, to these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. That's incredible evidence. And Paul signs out, 1 Corinthians 15, 8 says, and last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul is another hostile witness. Remember, Paul is the one who was arresting believers. His, the, the transformed life of Paul is evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and manifested himself, that shook Paul to the core. And he believed Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I, I don't know about you. Do you. Can you imagine an event that is born with, that is 500 eyewitnesses? Jesus appeared to 500. I mean, in, in a court of law, can you imagine lining up 500 people? each one bearing witness, credible witness, that Jesus rose from the dead. Dr. Edwin Yamauchi of Miami University says, what gives special authority to the list of the witnesses as historical evidence is the reference to most of the 500 brethren still being alive. St. Paul says in effect, if you do not believe me, you can ask them. Such a statement in an admittedly genuine letter is incredible. It's almost as strong evidence as one could hope to get for something that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. Incredible witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So my focus today is to let you know that, excuse me, that there is, the resurrection is a historical fact with incredible support. So our faith is not a myth. Remember we said Christianity is verifiable or falsifiable. If we could, punch holes into the resurrection story, then Christianity would not stand. So, let's look at the validity of the witnesses to this resurrection story. Remember today we are focusing on the biblical evidence of the resurrection. And next week we will look at non-biblical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the validity of the witnesses, we have eyewitness accounts. We talked about them. We gave you the incredible array of eyewitnesses. This is not something that only had one witness. It was incredible. But you also look at the variety of people. Not one kind of person, variety of people. 
Meru Siteni, Dean of the Graduate School of Theology at Wheaton College says, it is not worthy that these appearances were not stereotyped. No two of them are exactly alike. Each appearance was unique. He says, Mary Magdalene occurred in the early morning. The travelers to Emmaus in the afternoon. The apostles in the evening, probably after dark. He appeared to Mary in the open air. Mary was alone when she saw him. The disciples were together in a group. Paul records on one occasion, he appeared to more than 500 at one time. Thomas was obstinately incredulous when told of the Lord's resurrection, but worshipped him when Jesus manifested. So we see the evidence, different occasions. Each occasion had its own peculiar atmosphere and characteristics and revealed some different quality of the risen Lord. Jesus is the reason. Jesus rose again according to the scriptures. Thus, a matter of fact, Jesus rose again according to the scriptures. We need to understand that. But we looking at the validity from a biblical perspective, like we say, you also think about the inclusion of hostile witnesses. And we say that the hostile witness is somebody who, is, who do not have a bias. We talked about Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. We talked about James, the brother of Jesus. The Bible clearly says that the brothers of Jesus did not believe him. They doubted him. But when Jesus had an, when James had an encounter with Jesus, the risen Lord, he became a follower and became a key leader in the church and one of the early martyrs. And the, the martyrdom of James is not just in the book of Acts. It's attested to by Josephus, a historian, Egesippus, in Clement of Alexandria. So we have extra biblical testimony to, to this. So we see clearly that James doubted Jesus. The Bible says in James 1.1, 1, 1, it says, James a slave and servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 15.7, then after Christ's resurrection, he was seen by James. So James he had an encounter with Jesus that brought him to the faith. He was an unbeliever. He was a hostile witness. <clears throat> he didn't believe his brother had an encounter. And that's the evidence that we have. Think about Paul as a hostile witness. Says in Acts 23, 6, brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. He believed because of the resurrection. He had zeal. In Galatians 1, 13, he says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. But, as it says in Acts 26, 9 to 11, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus Christ. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them, often in all the synagogue, I tried to force them to blaspheme and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them, even to foreign cities. But along that journey, he encounters the risen Lord. And that's why he says, on the road to Damascus, he has an encounter with Jesus. He says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he says, last of all, I, I saw him too. He saw the risen Lord. And that changed 
his life forever. So I want you to understand there's so much biblical material. I mean, think about it. The evidence, the weight of material that speaks to the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus spoke about his resurrection. That you'd die. You'd be killed. You'll be buried. And on the third day, you'd rise again. And we see that this is actually what happened. And there was numerous incredible witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I, I have laid out this because Christianity is verifiable or can be is falsifiable. But we are not believing a myth. We are believing something that's documented, something that's factual, something that stands. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a cornerstone of the faith. We, without it, our faith is useless. We are in our sins. That's why we must contend, contest for the faith, for the resurrection of Jesus. There are many now even in churches who are beginning to doubt the resurrection, the moment you remove the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the faith, it's no longer the Christian faith. Salvation is not possible without believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. So it is important. So I, I know today I, I focused on the, to saying that resurrection is a, is a biblical fact, but also a historical fact. So I'm going, next week we're going to focus on the evidences of the resurrection. The, 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 that are non-biblical. And also even the, 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 the testimony of uh, non-believers historically that demonstrate the resurrection. Because if we can do that, we would have verified or the verification of the Christian faith. We said the faith Christianity is verifiable or it's falsifiable. And we are going to call in incredible witnesses to give testimony to the fact that Jesus rose again. The clear distinction of the Christian faith from every other movement, any religion or any faith, is this one fact, that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. That tomb is empty. I have stood in Jerusalem and peeped twice on two separate visits, gone up to Jerusalem, peeped into an empty tomb. We are not saying that's exactly the tomb that, that, that Jesus had lain. But we are saying we looked into an empty tomb because the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. That's why our faith stands. We must contend for the faith. Listen to me. This is a fundamental doctrine that Jesus rose from the dead. It's critical. So that's what the Bible teaches. So we're going to create a defense in, in next week. Then we are going to show the false theories of the resurrection that are being bandied around so that you know what we believe. So thank you so much. I trust that this has been informative and educational, and I hope you're finding it useful as we continue to look at that Nisim Creed. He says, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And we believe that. So we thank God. I hope you're finding it useful. Thank you so much. God bless you. This is the power signing off, and I trust that you continue as we continue to dig deeper and contend for the faith. Thank you so much and God bless you. Amen and amen. Mama,